and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this is week two of the basics, which is just a look at some fundamental things that we need to believe and need to follow and adhere to in order to to have a, a, a proper Christian faith. And today we're looking at the Word of God. And what it's all about is the Bible has been given to us as a tool to, to equip us and to encourage us for living in the kingdom of God in the world we live in. And to spend intentional time in the Bible, meditating on the words in it, is the only fuel that we need as followers of Jesus. So let us pray. Lord, we ask that you give us a hunger for your word, the bread of life, the word made flesh, the Bible. Help us to make time and space to meet with you in your word every day. Amen. Well, like I said, today we continue the, the basics. And last week we looked at the practice of consistent and bold prayer. Well, today we're looking at the word of God. There's a story told about a South Sea Islander who was proudly displaying a Bible that he had been given by a missionary to an American soldier during World War II. And the American soldier told him, he said, oh, we've, we've outgrown that sort of thing, you know, like, like the Bible and believing in Bible and, and believing in God. And this South Pacific native who had been a cannibal before he was saved, before he received the word of God, simply smiled back at the soldier and said, well, it's a good thing that we haven't stopped believing because if it weren't for this book, you'd be tonight's dinner. <laughs> and you know, and, and that's, that, this story is not necessarily true, but there are true stories of, of down in South America with the Aucas and, and Papua New Guinea where the missionaries came in and converted the, na the natives to Christianity and no longer are they killing or are they eating one another. And so, you know, we, we look at the Bible as being alive and active. I mean, that's what it tells us. But many people fail to see that. You know, surprisingly, the, the Russians and the Chinese and many dictators and many socialists recognize that the Bible actually is active and alive. And so they're very afraid of it. And they try to defeat it and, and the movement of Jesus. Well, today we're looking at the very word of God, the Bible, scripture. And you know, the Bible may seem to be a very important part of the Christian faith, but for some reason, the Bible is all too often overlooked or ignored in the busyness of our daily lives. But the simple truth is the Bible is anything but unimportant. And today we're going to look at the Word of God as living, active, 
and profitable for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training. And that's just scratching the surface. See, the Bible is full of wisdom and it's full of surprises. For instance, the Bible actually consists of 66 separate and distinct books. And they're divided, they're divided into two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you want a really w simple way to explain it to someone who, who asks what's the difference or what it's all about, well, the Old Testament is everything that happened before Jesus, and the New Testament is right before the time of Jesus. Jesus, his birth, and about 70 years after the crucifixion, and all about the apostles and the teachings of Jesus. So that's the difference. Well, for what we're looking at today, we're gonna to be looking primarily in the New Testament because we're gonna be learning from Jesus and we're gonna be learning from some of the original apostles. And everything these days is tracked, even the Bible and sales of the Bible. There's a monthly report, retail sales report of the Bible. And the latest one is from June 2020. And it, this is a comparison with the, the latest sales in June compared to the sales back in the year 2011. And so you look at this and it's got the top 10 sale, Bible sales and the first one is the New International Version, which in 2011 was also number one in sales. Number two is the King James Version, which was number two in 2011. And then number three is the New Living Translation, which was number four back then, so it's moved up one. And then Four is the English Standard Version. Five, the New King James Version. Six is the Christian Standard Bible, which is what most of, when I have scripture up, it, that's mostly where the, the Bible verses that I use are coming from. The Renea Valera, which is a Spanish version, which was not ranked 11 years ago. The New International Reader's Version, which probably I don't think many people have seen, but that is a simplified English New International Version. It's, 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 it, it's for children and for those that uh, English might be their second language or those that have trouble reading English. But it's number eight and it was number nine in 2011. The message translation is number nine, but it was number eight in 2011. And then the Nueva, Nueva version, which is another Spanish version of the Bible and basically the English translation is New Version International, which is a, a variation on the, the New International Version. So what you see here is there are now two Spanish Bibles in the top 10. Neither one of them was ranked in 2011. So, if, you're, if you know somebody that's going to college and they're looking for a language to study, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese. So interestingly enough, Youngstown State just canceled their Italian studies 
uh, major. Uh, so the New American Standard Bible is no longer in the top 10. Uh, in 2011, it was ranked number seven. In 2020, it was ranked number 10. And in this listing, it doesn't show up. Now, they just came out with a new American Standard Bible Translation 2020. And so it'll be interesting to see how that shows up in a, in a couple months. The new international, today's new international version, which was a new international version translation, but it was very unpopular. It was discontinued in 2011, but it ranked number 10 last year. And the Christian Standard Bible, which I talked about, was the Holman Christian Standard Bible in 2011. And it's not listed. But the biggest drop was the New American Standard, which is a very literal English translation. It's a very good translation, but it's very literal. It's very wooden. It went from number seven in 2011 to, like I said, it's out of the top 10. But the biggest gain is the Renea Valera, which went from unranked to number seven. So, Things are changing in the way of Bible translations. And again, if the best way to read the Bible is Hebrew and Greek, but most people don't read Hebrew and Greek. So this is the next best thing. And all of these I would recommend for studying, except for the message version because it's more of a paraphrase, but it's a, it's a good reading translation for at night or just to get a different view of the Bible. So, I don't know if that was helpful or not, but another interesting thing about the Bible is the Bible is the all-time best-selling book. Out of all the books that there are, the Bible is the best-selling book book in the history of the world. Now, back to today, the message. As of September 2020, the complete Bible has been translated into 704 languages. The New Testament has been translated into an additional 1,551 languages and parts of the Bible and Bible stories have been translated into 1,160 other languages. So, at least some portions of the Bible have been translated into 3,415 languages. And there's a scripture passage that says Jesus will not return until the Bible, until all the world has heard. We're getting closer and closer with all these different translations. And this is from the Wycliffe Bible translators, and their goal is to translate the Bible into every language in on the earth. And they're making, they're making good progress. The only thing I didn't look up to see was how many languages there are on the, on the earth. And I probably should have, did that, should have done that, but I didn't. So, it's important for everyone on the, the earth to have access to a Bible translation in their language. Why? Because it is a living, active, and profitable thing for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training. And, you know, the Bible is pretty amazing. I mean, it's an incredible gift that God has given us. And the best place for us to learn about the Word of God is from the Word of God. And that sounds like a play on words, but it's not. The best commentary on the Word of God is the Word of God. That's why you'll see 
when I give a, a, a verse, I'll, I'll take another verse that, that either gives more information or helps to explain the verse that I gave. Because the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So have you ever read the Bible and, and you're reading along and something just jumps out at you? It's as if the Bible knew what you needed to hear or see at that moment. Or have you, have you ever opened the Bible randomly and looked at a passage and, and that passage speaks so clearly into your life that it just seems supernatural? It, it just seems like, how did that happen? Well, if you felt either of these things, or if it's happened to you, then yeah, it, it, it's right. It is supernatural. Because the writer of Hebrews tells us that the Bible, the words of the Bible are both living and effective. Or living and active. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see that first part, for the word of God is living and active. It's alive. It's active. So when you read it and something jumps out at you, that's one of the reasons why. You know, this one verse tells us much about the Bible. Now, some translations say effective and powerful instead of living and active. But to be counted alive in this sense means you have to be among the living, not the dead. And the point is that the writer of Hebrews is making is that the words of the Bible are alive they're among the living just as just as other living things would be just as humans and animals are and, and would be and the word active also means that it's effective and productive in its work and so you know those of you that, that are here that have been reading the Bible for some time, I think we can agree that the, that the Bible is living, that it is active, that it is effective. And to drive the point home, the writer of Hebrews says, the word is more effective than a double-edged sword at dividing or cutting through the soul and the spirit. The thing about a double-edged sword is it cuts going in and it cuts going out. And so the word is powerful and it's able to get down to the heart of the matter. So if you ever read the Bible and it seems like the Bible is actually speaking to you or speaking to your situation, then I think it's fair to say that it probably was. And as we grow in our faith, it's important for us to continue returning to Scripture again and again, to submit ourselves to the Word of God and allowing the Spirit to work in and, and through our lives. Now, 1 
For some people, this may, may sound hokey or it may sound over, over spiritual. But I, I'll tell you this, try it. Try giving yourself considerable time in the Bible every day. Study the Bible, read the Bible. Just to see for yourself how powerful how profitable the Word of God is. And so, as it says in 2 Timothy, the Word is profitable. You know, when we hear the word profitable, and we, we think of something being profitable, more often you think about something in, in the terms of finances or, or money. But the word profitable is also synonymous with the words beneficial and useful. And so when the Apostle Paul is writing to the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy, he tells him this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now that's the, the CSB translation. The NSB says it like this. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Now, both of these say inspired, but other translations say God breath. God literally breathed himself, breathed his spirit into the word of God. And that's what makes it different from any other book that you will pick up or read. And you may have noticed that between these two verses, one says it's beneficial and the other says it's profitable. But the good news is the Bible is both of these things. It's useful, it's beneficial, and along with being living and active or effective in its work, the Bible is also excellent for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Now, each of these words could be a message by itself for, for Sunday. So we're not going to look at all of them, but more as a group. These words are important in the life of a disciple or a student of the Bible. And as we follow Jesus, then we will submit to his process, his plan, his direction for our lives. And simply put, the Bible is profitable for a disciple. Its profit is more than financial gain, it's, it's spiritual gain. Following Jesus will cost you. But the value that you gain from following Jesus cannot be estimated. Theologian pastor Dietrich Bonhoeff says this, Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. The gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life, and it's grace because it gives man the only true life. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer is right. 
It calls us to follow Jesus Christ, but it cost Jesus Christ his life. But it's also costly grace because it gives man, it gives us the only true life. And so here we are, here we are again sitting back at the feet of Jesus. This is where it all begins and this is where it ends for those who follow him. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, being taught by him from the word of God. And this brings us to the most important point of the day. The word, the Bible, is where you encounter Jesus because Jesus is the word. See, Jesus is the word logos in the Greek. And this is where it, it, it sometimes gets a little weird for people. It's, it's a theological, spiritual concept that sometimes we have trouble understanding or comprehending it completely. Now, Jesus spoke in parables and stories, which sometimes made it difficult to understand what he was really getting at or the point he was making. And the original disciples routinely struggled with the messages that Jesus was, was saying. But when we look at John's gospel, when Jesus talks about himself, it really is pretty clear what he's saying. Listen to these words from John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 and verse 14. In the beginning was the word logos, or you could substitute Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, Lagos, Jesus, was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were, were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has not been created. Verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. And then verse 14. The word, Lagos, Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, if you weren't sure about verse 1, about it being Jesus, verse 14 tells us very clearly and plainly that the Word of God is Jesus. And Jesus is God's Son. And so verse 1 clearly tells us that the Word was with God in the beginning and all things were made through the Word. There's life in the Word and the Word is the light of humankind. And then the point that's relevant for us in verse 14. And the Word became flesh. Human became human, walked the earth, and dwelt among us. Not only became human, but walked the earth just like any other human. And we saw his glory, the glory as of the only Son for the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the Gospel of John makes it very clear and very plain that the Word is, in fact, Jesus. And it couldn't be more clear than him saying the Word became flesh. 
Jesus is the Word, and the Word is Jesus. So, is this why Scripture is active and living? Well, of course it is. If the Word is Jesus, and Jesus is the Word, then when we read the Word, we are actually seeing Jesus, and through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is interacting with us. And it will seem like the, the, the Word is speaking directly to you. That it's addressing your need right then. That's because Jesus is in every Bible. Now God's ways are different from our ways. And I, I know that Jesus says some, some other interesting things in the, in the Gospels about how to see or how we see God. John chapter 6, verses 46 through 51. Je Jesus says, Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly I tell you that anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread. Jesus is talking about himself. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, we will live for it. He will live forever. The bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. The, Jesus be, goes from being the word, is the word, to becoming flesh. The flesh that dwelt among us and became a sacrifice for us. And in this passage and throughout John Gospel chapter 6, Jesus refers to himself as the living bread or the bread of life. And when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, he said this. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 4. It is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Jesus knew he didn't need another, he didn't need a, an actual loaf of a baked bread. What he needed and what we need is the very word of God. The living bread, the bread of life. There's other bread out there that satisfies earthly hunger. But there is nothing out there that will, will cure your spiritual starvation except the word, the bread, the living word, the bread of life. And only Jesus can do that. The Word made flesh, the bread of life, the Bible. So, it is of utmost importance in the life of, of a believer to be reading the Bible every day, to, to, to make a regular time to read the Bible, because there's nothing like it. There's no other book that has ever been written. And I can guarantee you that there is not another book in existence that we would say is alive and active. And I understand that life gets complicated. And, and almost before you know it, your, your Bible reading plan is... A bust. It's done. You look at those, those, those check marks, and you got more empty check marks than you have completed check marks. Or, or if you use it electronically, it tells you, well, you haven't read. 
you've got this many passages to read. So, I mean, life gets to you sometimes, so it gets hard. Or the devotional that you bought to help you, to give you some structure in, in reading and learning the Word of God it is nothing more than, than a book sitting on the table or up on the, on the shelf. So instead of a, a, another checkmark plan or you know, a bunch of just get out there and, and, and do it. Let's look back at the words of Jesus. You know, many of you are, are familiar with these words of Jesus because it comes from the Lord's Prayer where Jesus simply says, Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Jesus wasn't talking about fresh baked Italian bread. What if he was talking about the bread of life? What if he was instructing his disciples to, to pray for him? What if God gives us daily access to Jesus through his word? And wouldn't that be an amazing way for, for God the Father to provide for all his children? So give it a try this week. Open the Bible, read it, and you will find that the Bible is alive and active and useful and effective and powerful. And the bottom line is, Jesus needed it, and he tells us that we need it, is that we need daily bread. And the best source for the daily spiritual bread that we need is the Bible. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, help us to continue to seek out your word, the Bible. To make it a part of our lives and to see the difference and the power and the change that it makes in our lives and the lives of others. Because your word is the only thing that will end our spiritual starvation and will give us guidance for the right paths and the decisions we need to make in life. We ask this in your name. Amen.